I'm Dr. Andy Martin with the Marcus Heart Valve Center here at Piedmont, Atlanta, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Vinny Bapat. Vinny is the consultant cardiothoracic surgeon known to many of you, and he's at St. Thomas Hospital in London, and also joined by my colleague, Dr. Jim Calton, who's also a, an excellent cardiac surgeon. So, Vinny was joining us today to help us with a, a very unique uh, valve and MAC, mitral valve and mitral annular calcification that Jim did, and and um, outstanding results so far. But, but you know, Vinny, it, it, it's really an exciting time, I think, in, in valvular heart disease. And you, you two represent really what I call the, the new breed of cardiac surgeons in that you both have wire skills, you're doing a lot of transcatheter skills and, and incredible surgical skills. So we're going to talk a little bit about what are the new options for mitral valve disease. So why don't you take us through this? Absolutely. I think, uh, I think Jim will agree with me that uh, this is what we call as the gold standard right. Right. and uh, traditional options. So uh, replacement and mainly repair nowadays, uh, but they are technically challenging. And Jim, if you want to just walk through uh, what well, are the challenges? You know, we certainly uh, the, the approach, it's, it's challenging for the patient with a sternotomy healing right. afterwards. We try to improve that with minimally invasive techniques. And also other factors that, that lend to increased risk would be uh, reoperations right. and, and comorbidities that they, they have maybe during the reoperative period that they didn't during their first operation. Anatomy can be difficult, uh, particularly in the mitral area with uh, mitral annular calcification. And the particularly in the aortic area, we can have difficult anatomy with, with a small, small annulus, a small root that require other more complicated techniques to, uh, to, uh, to be able to get an adequate size valve into them. You know, and seeing the aging population, the increasing valve disease, we're certainly seeing a lot of uh, annular calcification. I mean, it's all, all over the place. Absolutely. And, uh when we talk about these, we always forget that in expert hand, a lot of things are so easy, but we're talking of applying this technology to everyone like in Tower. And so I think uh, this is what uh, the, the new theme, so to speak, of okay. the transcatheter the valve the is the heart team. team. Yes. So already we have seen all over the world uh, that we have used Tower valves in a variety of indications in failed valves or repairs, Correct. for example, MAC and pediatric patients. Uh, there are three devices which are used currently in the mitral okay. uh, because of their shorter in height. And obviously, that's what makes them easier to use uh, for this indication. So you're talking really low profile. Is it really low profile is the key because uh, longer is the profile, of course, um, the left ventricle can be very small itself. and. Uh, the other thing is the LVOT obstruction, which we're going to discuss a bit later. Sounds like the old Star Edwards valves in the mitral, those big things. That got, <laughs> <All right. laughs> they ended up taking up half the left ventricle. But yeah, so that's great. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think the way these, devi they, these devices were made for aortic use, and uh, but we have slowly started using them for the mitral use. Okay. So okay. majority of them can be used uh, through a small keyhole done through the left chest as Jim did in the morning. Um, so this is just a case of a uh, mitral valve in a valve. Uh, this is use of the sapien valve in the mitral. And uh, Jim, if you want to, um, you, have, you have done cases like these. Yes, we have. This, and this is a sapien, and it looks like it's being implanted in a, an Edwards mitral prosthesis. And uh, looks like good position here with the valve. Uh, it's the, the plane looks appropriate, and I, I think this looks like a very good result. And Vinny, you, you, you were talking to us earlier this morning. I know you've uh, published extensively that with the, the, the plethora, plethora of valve types that you have there, knowing that valve type and where to position the valve and valve is yeah. really critical. I think it's very important, and uh, that's why we made some mistakes earlier on, and now it's become uh, quite a common knowledge. We have got good uh, guidance available now for this. Uh, but what really strikes me when I look at this picture again and again and again is the fact that if me and Jim were doing this as an open heart operation, this would have taken us four hours to do with some blood loss and a full sternotomy, while this operation in, uh, was done in 45 minutes with no blood loss. Right. Right. I think this is the key thing. 
And now what's evolving as well is as the mitral repair is getting popular, but mitral repairs do fail. And uh, this is just a case of a wall in a ring, uh, which again has the same uh, advantage, so to speak, of uh, doing it through transapical. Uh, have you, Jim, any, done any wall in a ring up till now? We have. We've, we've done uh, valve and mitral rings. We've done valve and tricuspid rings. Yeah. So it's, I, I think that's, that's it's very useful. Uh, I think it's especially exciting in the tricuspid Correct. area because these tricuspid patients often are very difficult to manage medically. They're very sick, might have right ventricular dysfunction. So it's, I think it's, it's exciting technology. Yeah, it really is. Absolutely. And I think the beauty of it is this was never designed to be used this way and we have found these new exciting uses. And the, the new frontier, so to speak, is MAC or mitral annular calcification. And uh, I must congratulate your team here today. Um, I looked up in the clock and it was just 10 o'clock. I'm not used to that. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have some surgical we challenges. We had excellent proctoring, that's the deal, <laughs> and an excellent operator. So I think, Jim, you know, as a surgeon, these can be challenging, right? And uh, um, if you could walk us through which patients or what difficulties a surgeon can face. Well, you know, what we're talking about is mitral annular calcification and, and that can be a varying degrees the, the the problems that we have as a surgeon is is first of all getting sutures or needles through the through the calcified material and then the other thing that we worry about is we want the valve to seat so that there's no paravalvular leak and the you know there's there's the also the concern of of, of a atrial ventricular groove Absolutely. separation Absolutely. which which is disastrous, and, and it seems like a, a, a lot of these patients that we see with bad MAC are these these little fragile old ladies that uh, you look at them, and if you're not careful, you end up with an AV groove separation. So uh, it's oh. it's a problem that sometimes it's we we might get in there, we might find that it's too severe to safely do it with standard surgical techniques. So. I, I think that particular problem has opened a stage for other transcatheter right, right, technologies. Right. right. I mean, it's, it's a fabulous, um, fabulous ap application for a patient who needs help in this position because they often have infotrach stenosis, basically. Yeah. So if you put one in, what are the problems? Is that what you can tell us the problems? Absolutely, because I, uh, <laughs> so I think the, we have seen now very well that the therapy area only evolves if we understand the problem. Correct. And uh, these could be the three problems, uh, and we have encountered all of them in different situations. Uh, one is what we call as LVOT or left ventricle outflow, so forward flow obstruction. So this, uh, Vinny, this and, and Jim, this is, uh, is comparable to post mitral valve repair SAM. In other words, you're looking at, at, at right. everything being shoved too anteriorly or, or your orientation being off. Absolutely, because what we've what we forget sometimes is that although the tower valve is a stent, once it's covered with the anterior leaflet, it becomes a covered stent, and that's what the problem is. The second thing is embolization, because uh, we haven't understood yet um, the correct algorithm for sizing or oversizing needed, so we are still figuring it out. And uh, very rarely you get what is known as leaflet infolding. But but go on, I want to go back to the embolization because I think uh, most of it, and you guys certainly know this, and uh, is that the mitral valve is under intense pressure. It's different than the than the TAVR valve, where yeah. the TAVR is facing diastolic pressure That's in right. essence, and this is facing systolic ventricular pressure. Yeah, I think the pressure which is equivalent uh, from a square inch or square millimeter area is apparently equal to a, a space shuttle taking off. Uh, that's right. quite a lot, I think. And every time, 70 times a minute it's closing, it's trying to push it up. Um, and and the, the leaflet infolding you say you don't see commonly? I mean, it would really need a really long anterior leaflet, is that? Yeah, is that? and that's correct. I think okay. the only case we have seen it is where it's a myxomatous valve and there's a lot of mitral tissue mm -hmm. and then that it kind of infolds. But it has it has not caused problem except in one case okay. I know. Okay. So, and these issues, uh, I think it's important as a heart team when we select a patient for this therapy, 
is that we take into consideration these three problems okay. because when these three problems happen, they suddenly change the game. Suddenly, the a difficult case becomes very difficult right, case. Right. Right. And uh, this is where I think uh, a lot of research work is going on and uh, we are involving teams across Atlantic now. And this is where the next theme of it comes is, can you use the tower valve in, as an open case? It means not use a standard surgical valve, but in the same patients use a tower valve, keep the operation time down, keep the trauma of the operation down, but avoid those one or two problems which we saw. And uh, I think this is the so to speak, a true hybrid area which is developing very fast. So this would be, and I know you're going to show us the case, but what you're showing us here is that you are, are have uh, open visualization, so you're obviously open chest or open port and looking in, and then you would use the Taver valve in the in the MAC. And in what's, that you know, what's, what's interesting about this is, you know, we've been doing surgery long enough, uh, doing surgery before the time we had these trans catheter technologies, we, we get in there and we see a patient who has MAC that we can't effectively operate or safely operate and, and then you, you don't have any options. You end up closing them up and, and it's, you know, the outcomes often are the same. Right. So, you know, again, I think this is, uh, uh, I think this is good for the patients. It's, it looks like good technology to help a surgeon get out of trouble. Absolutely, and I think this is only possible if you are a tower surgeon as such. And so you know the, not the, just the know-how, but even the skill of using it. Right. Uh, I think uh, that's where... So you're, you're showing us a couple things here which are important. Absolutely. So you, you've taken the anterior leaflet out. So we have taken the anterior leaflet out. So okay. even if the valve sits in the LVOT, it's not going to cause a problem because when the leaflets of the tower valve close, it's open stent. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the second thing is, of course, if needed, you can suture it uh, to give it extra security so it's not going to embolize. And third, again, because the anterior leaflet is not there, it's not, there's no going to be infolding. So, so let, me, uh, let me be the simpleton here and ask, so if you've got all this annular calcification, how do you, and you, were, you told me earlier that suturing and, and all that's yeah. going to be difficult and you're worried about that, how do you suture this in place. So there are three ways of doing this which uh, people have tried. Uh, one is uh, you don't suture, just deploy just the deploy valve it. Okay. and then put only four or five sutures so you can sleep well in the night uh, without worrying. So you do it like you would do a transcatheter yeah. mitral. Absolutely. Back. Okay. And what I have done in the past, uh, I've used actually, I've used a very flexible ring okay. of a known size. Okay. I've sutured it on the atrial side or okay. to wherever I can get purchase and that allows me to implant an open valve in a ring. And some people have used uh, some Teflon felts to, you know, just anchor the valve. So I'm going to show you a quick okay. case. Let's, yeah, uh, let's see, that's, that's um, great. So this is a case which was referred to us. Uh, you can see that uh, there's a lot of aortic calcification. Right. And then there's a severe mitral annular calcification, oh, horseshoe right. so, shape. So. Uh, she was referred to us for a transepical tower in aortic and mitral. Okay. So when we looked at our analysis, we realized that if we do that, uh, it's going to cause LVOT obstruction for okay. sure. She also had a left main, so we decided we are going to do it open, do an open tower, replace the aortic valve with a surgical valve and do a bypass. bypass as well. But she was 84, so this is exactly what we did. Uh, I'm just going to play this movie a bit later. Uh, so this is, shows a full sternotomy here. Uh, you can see the aortic valve which is open and I, I'm going to replace it a bit later. But here, interestingly, I put a sapien valve in the mitral. So uh, this procedure took me nearly 12 minutes as against it would have normally taken me at least uh, 60 minutes. So you, you put yeah. the, the sapien transcatheter valve right, okay. in, the, right in the MAC? Right in the MAC. And, uh, then we replace the aortic valve. You can see the Lima 2 LED right, here with right, the Bulldog. Right. And then this is just a post-op uh, fluoro of the same patient. And uh, you can see very nicely how the whole yeah. <laughs> mechanism works. And this patient is now one and a half years down the line and she's doing very, very That's well. Fabulous. Uh, so we were very pleased with the result. Um, and as I said, because we have a heart team or tower team, I could get a crimp nurse in my theater and uh, do it very, we have valves off the shelf mm -hmm. so we can use it. So similarly, 
uh, we haven't stopped at that. This is a very complicated pediatric case. Already a fourth time operation. Mm. They have tried everything. And uh, the mechanical valve has now thrombosed despite good INR or warfarin right. therapy. Uh, so in this patient, we felt that what we should do is we should suture a tower valve. Uh, but at the level of the annulus, it would have been smaller. So we are going to use a trick as we used in the previous patient. We're going to use a ring which is slightly atrial, one centimeter atrial, and then deploy the bigger size valve, uh, which is uh, good for this patient. This is again uh, in- So you, you effectively change the level of the annulus. Absolutely. That technique. Yeah. Right. And what we, we're trying to think is uh, because it's a tissue valve, uh, this child is going to come back again at some point. And uh, if we need to do a valve in valve, it shouldn't cause any LVOT obstruction in future. And so this is just to show you the post-op case, you know, echo, it's just amazing, I yes, feel. it is, absolutely. Um, and it has got, I think, a very big, you know, EOA compared to the surgical valve this child would have had. So, so I mean, this is, this is pretty dramatic. I mean, the, the fact that you can now use the transcatheter techniques, which you guys have learned and certainly pioneered in a lot of ways to start attacking mitral valve cases that would have been surgically very difficult or what you've been prohibited. Or disastrous. Yeah, or disastrous. Do, you think, do you think yeah. that's gonna, I mean, is it, are we gonna, we're gonna see more of this, don't you think? I think absolutely it means, um, I completely agree with Jim, is when we are faced with this, many times we just close and think MR yeah, will yes, go away, yes. right. but it doesn't. And I think we can change the prognosis of the patient by doing this. Uh, but the, the key is we still need to understand it a bit more robustly and standardize this so that we have best results for everyone. The, Jim, I mean, if, if you certainly, Vinny has um, taught us a lot about this over the years, I think, with, with Oh, as, as, you, as you look down the path, where do you think this leads the, the surgeon? I mean, is the surgeon going to need to get wire skills and to do things so that they can have these capabilities in their hands? Well, it's, it's clear to me with, with the results of the trials thus far that it's here. It's useful technology. It's very good technology. And we're even looking at mitral technologies. We're looking at using transcatheter aortic technologies in uh, intermediate risk patients and low risk patients, right, right. which is soon to come on the horizon. And uh, it, you know, I, I, think, I think to be able to have every tool in your toolbox, you're gonna have to understand the transcatheter technologies as well as the, the valvular technologies that we've had, you know, the, the, the suturing sure. of surgical valves. And, and, and I, I think my suspicion is, is that the longevity of these valves is going to be very good. Right. Uh, that's always a concern at the beginning, but uh, from what we've seen so far, the, the longevity has been good. And I, I think to, to be able to provide the most for your patients, you, you have to be able, you have to be adept at both uh, technologies. I mean, it, it really, I mean, it's exciting. How, how, how'd you get into doing this? So I think, uh, again, I had a very good trained, support. You were trained, well, I mean, you were trained as, as a classic, uh, obviously, I was great a, training. Absolutely. It means I think the advantage was I was a young surgeon. <laughs> I had plenty of time on my hands. Uh, that is the time when the tower was not very attractive right. to a lot of people. Right. And I got involved. I got introduced to the cardiology field, and I realized that it's an ever-changing field. We surgeons usually don't change so quickly. Uh, I started working on, I, as I started training centers, I realized that I need to have good wire skills, good echo skills, as well as being a good surgeon to interact and take some people I've never met in my life through a very difficult procedure. Right. So uh, I trained myself and I've seen now that I'm not the only one. There are hundreds of surgeons who are doing right. it now. So I think as I completely agree with Jim. I think we have to have all all the you know tools we need uh, for a particular patient. We need to have a tailored approach to any given patient, and then the difficult patients become easier. Do you th uh, uh, we need to we need to wind this up at some point, but I, I can't leave without asking a question. Should the surgeon who has really understands the anatomy? I mean, the interventionalist understands the anatomy, but not like the surgeon understands the anatomy. Should the surgeon be intimately involved in transcatheter mitrals 
because the mitral is a different animal than the transcatheter aortic. The surgeon should, I think the surgeon has to be involved in this mm. transcatheter mitral. There's no question, I think, and all the devices we're going to see them are going to be transhepical again. Uh, so I think, but we surgeons have to change our tack now. Um, so we have learned to work with the fluoro. Right. Now we have to learn the echo imaging properly. So if we want to get involved in mitral, I always tell my surgical colleagues is, start attending mitral clip cases, start attending Correct. mitral LA appendage closure because it gives you, uh, you adapt to a different environment completely now. You probably are reacting to a dynamic echo rather than fluoro. A lot of these procedures are echo based. And I think surgeons should lead this for sure with the help of right. interventionist and very good echo support. Well, I, I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, while 4.0 is certainly with, with the minimal uh, approach to TAVRs now, um, you know, TEs are not used, and CT for planning in 4.0, but I think in, in interventional mitrals and tricuspids of the future, echo will be critical. A good way, a good way to get into that is to use transesophageal echo on every open heart case that you do. Correct. And that, that way you get exposure and, and you learn, and, and uh, that's, that's been useful for us. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. Well, listen, Vinny, you've, you've, it's been great to have you here at Piedmont, and you've, uh, you and Jim did a fabulous case today that we'll show the audience at a later date. But thanks so much for all you've done, and thanks for coming to visit us. Thank you very much for and having Jim, me. And Jim, congratulations Andy, thank you. today. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you for joining us. We will hope you'll come back.